Thank you, Sig, for those superb introductions. We will begin this evening's seminar with the Philadelphia Inquirer series, Assault on Learning. For over a year, five reporters from the Philadelphia Inquirer examined violence in the city's public schools. The public school system is often hidden from view. It's shielded by locked doors, metal detectors, security guards. The Inquirer investigated what lay behind that shield. What they found was shocking. Every school day, 25 students, teachers, or staff members are beaten, robbed, sexually assaulted, or otherwise victimized by violent crime. The Inquirer team did what no one had done before. They revealed the magnitude of the problem. To do this, they poured over reports collected by the school district. They also went through police reports and records of 911 calls. They found dozens of violent assaults that the school district had failed to report. They documented how serious incidents were downgraded to conceal the severity of the problem. School principals, they found, often hid the assaults. The reporters interviewed more than 300 teachers, administrators, students, and their families. They talked to school district officials, police officers, court officials, and school violence experts. They found violence even in preschools, where teachers were assaulted by students or where kids beat each other up in bloody brawls. Nearly one in five of the attacks were perpetrated by students aged 10 or younger. The reporters profiled a 10-year-old who was charged with assault because he gave his teacher a black eye. But the inquiry went beyond that incident, probing the culture of violence and misery of the neighborhood where the student lived. In an amazing feat of data journalism, the Inquirer created a database to analyze more than 30,000 serious incidents, from assaults to robberies to rapes, that occurred during the past five years. They also worked with Temple University on a survey that asked teachers and aides questions about the violence and its impact on students' education. In addition, the Inquirer team found more than a dozen school police officers who had been arrested on drug possession, assault, theft, and other charges in recent years. One officer with an assault record had ignored reports of sexual assaults on, on, teacher, on students. Another had allowed into the school an angry man who threatened to attack students with a gun. But the power of this series does not lie in the data alone. It's, it lies in the stories of the students, teachers, and parents who struggle with violence every day. These stories were so horrifying that Philadelphia authorities promptly took action. Within five months, the school district superintendent was replaced, and the leadership of the school district was overhauled. Schools began getting serious about reform. Violent incidents are now posted online to prevent principals from suppressing the numbers. A safe schools advocate was appointed, and the standards for hiring and training school cops have been upgraded. Susan Snyder and Mike Leary, congratulations for an amazing series. Thank you. Thanks. Very much appropriate to our theme tonight, which is holding up the mirror. You held up the mirror to the Philadelphia school system, and the picture we all saw was not pleasant. Before we go into the nitty-gritty of this investigation, I want to know what set off this project and how, in this age of downsizing and budget cuts, how did you get the inquiry to commit the time and resources to an investigation that took more than a year? Yeah, I think I can help out with that one. Um, basically, this all got started because um, of violent attacks that occurred at South Philadelphia High School in December of 2009. Uh, and, and a number of Asian students were beaten uh, inside the school, outside the school. <coughs> and the school district was very slow to react to that. Uh, and it, it, it created, there was a, a national investigation into that, but basically, uh, as horrible as that situation was, it, it really wasn't all that unusual in the school district. And I had covered the schools for about 10 years and had written lots of stories about, uh, you know, gangs roaming the school hallways. Um, there was a case of a teacher uh, who was assaulted by a student and his neck was broken and it, you know, essentially ended his uh, teaching career. So um, the paper, of course, we, we've written about these stories, but at this time, after the attacks at South Philadelphia High School, the paper decided it was time to really take a look at violence from every angle, 
and to look for possible solutions and really try to address this like we had never addressed it before. And that's why they ended up assembling a team of five reporters who they largely detached to work on this. And the team, the, the team and members itself, I think were, was really important because you had um, myself who had been a beat reporter for 10 years, the current beat reporter, Kristen Graham, uh, Dylan Purcell, who was our, our um, data guy, you know, computer assisted, um, did all the analysis of the database. Uh, and then you had John Sullivan, uh, who really wanted to investigate investigate school violence, actually went to the editors and said, I'd like to do this. He was um, one of our top investigative reporters. Uh, and finally, Jeff Gamage, who uh, was the reporter who was able to get himself uh, embedded at South Philadelphia High School um, in the aftermath of those attacks and look at how a new principal was trying to change the culture. So, I mean, basically, um, the paper decided that, you know, this was such an important issue, it, it, that our, you know, children, education, our future, that we needed to um, make that commitment. Uh, I think that uh, one of the things to remember is that every newspaper ought to do this kind of uh, reporting. That uh, why in a time of straightened resources did we decide to do this? At the Inquirer, we had a long tradition. It was kind of in our DNA to do it. And uh, I think one of the, the things we did is, uh, you know, as an editor, we arranged for other people to take over these beats, so we sustained our daily coverage. But there are um, subjects of such overriding importance in the community that we want to get to the bottom of them. And the, the truth is, many stories are only told because of the dedication of reporters and because a news organization commits itself to do it. Uh, if, if we don't do it, uh, basically it doesn't get done. And the story we wanted to tell, as Sue said, um, it's, it's kind of a given that in big city schools there's violence. That's not shocking to students in the schools. They experience it on a daily basis. Uh, but it was shocking to people outside of the schools. And that's really what uh, drove reform, is that even the mayor, whose uh, daughter was in, a, in a, a fairly good public school, a magnet school, said, I can't believe this is going on in my own school district. And it, yet it was every day. Mike, I think one of the unsung heroes in investigative reporting are the investigative editors, like you are the investigative editor. What, what, is, what was it like, you know, like, you're like the orchestra leader here, working with five reporters and getting them to work well together and to produce stories? Well, I, I've worked on investigative series with reporters who didn't even speak to each other, and uh, uh, that, that was a true test of, uh, of skill, and that was actually a project I did when I was at the Baltimore Sun in cahoots with another Tribune paper in Orlando. And remember the Orlando reporter sent a peace plant to, um, to my <laughs> reporter, and the first thing he says, it won't work. Uh, so that took a lot of, that, that really took a lot of me to kind of put that together. In this case, it was a lot easier because the reporters really were a team and they didn't um, act jealously. And for me, it was more like a ringmaster, just coordinating what they were doing and focusing what they were doing. That at, at a certain point, uh, people uh, will do a lot of research and some of the reporters I had were such maniacs, they would still be researching. Uh, but you have to say, okay, I see the shape of the series, I, I know the forms the stories need to take, here's what has to get done, and there's a deadline. Let's, I'm not like Luke Grant, if you remember that, where Billy and Rossi would work for weeks on a story, and then Luke Grant would say, well, it's two hours to deadline, better get writing. Well, no, I mean, realistically, this took weeks to write. But I had to say, at a certain point, if this is going to be done, and we're going to do it, and we're going to do it this way, and these are the stories. I just add one thing to that. Um, I think you know Mike won't say this, but his role was crucial to the series. I mean, I mean, basically, I know as as a beat reporter, I'd never been part of an investigation like this before. But really, it was kind of like daunting, like almost like building a pyramid, you know. And I thought that scared me—the idea of building a pyramid. But building a piece of a pyramid day by day and like going out and finding something out, coming in and telling Mike about it, having Mike gear, you know, steer and guide uh, really just was, you know, meant so much. So I just wanted to say that. Let's talk about the data that was produced um, from this project. It's amazing. You found 30,000 incidents of serious assault. Can you tell us where you got that information? Well, uh, we obtained the data. Uh, <laughs> In part, it was a long struggle uh, to get the data from the school district, which maintained it. Um, records of assault, uh, unfortunately, they didn't uh, maintain it in a, uh, in a usable form. So it, it took a lot of time to crunch the numbers. And then 
you know, we didn't really believe the numbers once we got them because we came up with um, additional information that hundreds and hundreds of cases were being suppressed. Uh, and how did we figure that out? We uh, actually found arrest records, police arrest records, where complaints had been made and police had arrested uh, individuals for school violence. These weren't in the documents. Uh, another way we were able to match up and get more re a realistic feel for the numbers was Sue uh, had terrific sources she developed as a school reporter and uh, she got thousands of internal school police records uh, leaked to her. Uh, it, one of the things to remember is, is that uh, this is often a, a, a human business that you uh, get uh, information often because you've established relationships with individuals. I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, younger reporters I sometimes think, think they can Google things and the answer is somewhere out there in, in the ether or they can file a FOIA and, and that's a good thing. Both things are good things. There are elements of research. <laughs> but realistically, the, the reason Sue got a lot of documentation, including a pretty stunning uh, video, a school security video, is because she worked sources. People knew her. They knew her over a period of time. They trusted her and uh, they knew what she was doing was important. So they, they were glad to assist her. You, you mentioned a video. I'd like us to go to that now and Sue can you tell us a little bit about it and how you got it and sure. what role this video we're going to show you a powerful video what role this video played in the story sure uh, basically uh, the lead um, case in our series uh, was about um, uh, Tashada Herring a uh, student at Auden Reed High School and she was in class one day taking a test and a group of students had walked the halls for a period of time and then rushed into a classroom and, and beat her up. And we had heard about the fact that there was a video, um, security, a school security video that captured um, these students walking the halls. We knew it existed. We knew it had been used in a court case, but we were, had a very difficult time getting it. Because it was sealed. Yes, and it wasn't, so basically, um, you know, I went to all the sources that I was turning to normally and none of them could get it for me. So what I did in the end, when Mike said to me, you got to get that video again, you got to get it. And I'm like, what am I going to do? So I went back to all of my um, uh, sources and I said, brainstorm with me. If you don't have it, who else might? Let's broaden the universe where I might look, find this. And so finally, I found someone who had the video, was willing to give it to us. And it was just, you know, weeks before publication. I'd like to show it. We'd like to show it. On the morning of January 22, 2010, Auden Reed High student Tashada Herring went to school worried. There were signs that she might be in for trouble, a fight she witnessed but didn't participate in, ominous text messages and Facebook posts warning of coming attacks. Tashada was so anxious in her first period algebra class that teacher Michelle Davis sent her to another room to calm down and take her test. And she came in very upset, um, saying, saying that she didn't want to take the test. I don't remember exactly what else she was saying, and I told her she either had to sit down and take the test quietly or she was going to have to leave. But when Tashada saw girls engaging in a pre-fight ritual, fitting scarves to their heads and smearing Vaseline on their faces to keep hair from getting pulled out and faces from scarring, Tashada was sure they were coming for her. I had to watch my surroundings. So she told me to get out of the classroom and go across the hall. And when I went across the hall, they followed me. But Tashada couldn't calm down, even in Bryn Keller's classroom. She kept looking out into the hallway. Eventually, Tashada saw a band of 15 to 20 students, including the girls in headscarves she'd seen on her way into school, roaming the hallways. They looked into every classroom window they passed, searching for their target, Tashada. Eventually, they spotted her in Keller's classroom, and they burst into the room. It was one male student followed sort of by a group of students. And they came in and one female asked me questions and she asked me questions and I, I, I guess I didn't give her the, re the answer she wanted so she hit me and then we, fight, we started fighting. There were maybe 10 to 15 students uh, attacking her um, with, you know, a growing number of students coming into the classroom to watch. The attack left Tashada bloody and sore. Chunks of her hair were yanked out from the front half of her head. There were welts on her face and a lump under her eye. It was important to Tashada that she not show weakness, but the damage to her body was undeniable. 
I mean, the, the interesting thing is that uh, in the security tapes we got, we also got uh, a school security tapes that continued on for probably another 15 minutes. And there was another fight within three minutes that, in contrast to this one, the, the security cameras are on the hallway, so you didn't actually see what went on in the classroom. The other one actually showed um, a girl getting attacked in the hallway and falling to the ground and getting repeatedly kicked and punched. Um, and that one, the school uh, security guards eventually intervened and took away some of the students in uh, handcuffs. But uh, literally, these were two attacks on different floors of the school within a few minutes. And this is just one school among uh, 260 schools. And while not every school was affected by violence, uh, as uh, you know, you heard earlier what Sheila said, there were 25 incidents like this every day in, in Philadelphia public schools. How, how did you verify these incidents? I mean, it's, you had this rare opportunity here because you had footage from, but you had other stories in that series where, you know, you had stories of students assaulting other students or assaulting teachers. Yeah. Well, in every case that we had, we went to, like if it was happened at a certain school, we went to the principal to get their side of the story. But the other thing we also did was we, um, we sat down with the school district administrators uh, a couple times during the series, I think it was two or three times, uh, and really present it. We wanted to say, here's our findings. Here's everything we have. We want you to know everything that's going to be in this series. So you, we want to hear what you have to say. And what we typically got from them was, all right, 30 minutes, got to go. Okay, not much time, you know. Really, they didn't really don't want to spend a lot of time um, with us. But um, it, it basically, uh, you know, that's one. Of, that's that's some of the things we did was we just presented our findings to you know the principals, the administrators to get their side of it. And whenever possible, we looked for you know public records to back up the stories. Um, and I think that was you know we were able to. We we ended up not having any corrections in the series. Well, so, in, yeah. in some cases they weren't public records. Also, as I mentioned earlier, we got thousands of internal school district police reports that recorded these incidents in, in pretty specific details. So we knew the names of the perpetrators, we knew the victims' names, we knew their phone numbers and addresses. And again, I'd emphasize this this was source reporting. This was Sue, who had established a long track record of uh, within the schools and had the confidence of many people who were willing to give her these kind of records that allowed us to document what was going on. and and. As she said, you know, there weren't any corrections. I mean, this, here was a school district that was just itching to discredit this series, and, it, and it's it, kind of a lesson for, for doing any kind of strong reporting. You know, if there's one small thing that's wrong, um, people who are aggrieved uh, or who, who don't like the results of the series will pick away with that and seek to discredit it. So we really took a lot of time to fact check things, but we had a document for everything. And what, what, can I just add one thing? One, one thing that was really important too, I think at the end was um, when we did win, um, we got an email from the school district, the new administration, congratulating us and telling us in an email that we made a difference in the schools and, and we really couldn't have been paid a higher compliment. This, this series dealt with school children, minors, who were both victims and perpetrators of the violence. Um, what ethical and privacy issues did you have to deal with, you know, like photographing, identifying um, underage school children? Well, um, one, one thing to remember actually uh, for reporters is, is that uh, you, you do often have access to juvenile court proceedings. They aren't, they aren't sealed and there's a lot of information to be gained attending those proceedings and looking at juvenile records. The, uh, availability of data uh, varies from state to state. Also, in sever several of these incidents, um, the perpetrators or the, were charged as adults um, with, with felony crimes, so they weren't necessarily adjudicated in, in juvenile proceedings. Um, but uh, we did pay uh, obvious attention to the ages of, of, of some of the individuals and their identities. For example, in, in uh, you did hear Sheila mention a 10-year-old boy who blackened the eye of her, the teacher. We, we talked extensively to the family. Uh, we uh, did not name uh, the child uh, because of his age. Uh, we did name the mother who had a different name, which provided a shield for him. While we ran a picture of him, it was not a picture that he could be identified. Uh, it was in profile with his face turning away. Um, so we, we did um, 
you know, really draw the line. But, but also one of the things we really did try to do, which I think is unusual in a lot of these series uh, or other depictions of violence or bullying in schools, uh, many accounts that you will see uh, only speak to the people who are the victims. Uh, we made a special effort to talk to the people who committed these acts and to, to sort of understand why uh, they did that. And the, one of the most interesting um, aspects of the series was we talked to, uh, you know, three young uh, boys who were uh, basically, what they did is they waded into a crowd of uh, elementary school kids with uh, baseball bats and wailed on them and they were playing hooky from school, these were kids who were supposed to be in a school intervention program, which was a, essentially a fraud. And with the cooperation of their parents, uh, we got their school files to show that the schools basically were just pretending to intervene with them and put them on the right track. So we, we spent a lot of time <laughs> making sure that, uh, you know, we, we protected the identities, or if we used the identities, that we had adequate or sufficient permissions to, to use those. I think I mentioned to you, Sheila, that um, we, we did interview a number of people, teachers, um, parents, who then came back to us later and said, you know, I'm uncomfortable. I've decided I don't want to be part of the series. And because these are people who weren't used to dealing with the press, we did honor that and say, okay, that's fine. We understand that. Let me interrupt by asking the audience, if you, if you want to ask questions, we have five minutes for your questions, please go up to the microphones and identify yourself. While you're doing that, I'd like to ask Sue to tell us how she started working on this series. You know, Sue has been covering education for many years. So what, what did you do when you okay. said, you know, oh, yes. your paper said, uh -huh. we, we want to do a series on school violence. What did you do next? Well, I, as I covered the school, schools for 10 years, um, during that time, every time I went out to do a story, whether it was a feature story, trend story, whatever, I would always ask the teachers, principals, whoever I was interviewing, parents for their um, cell phone numbers, home numbers, and I kept a master list. And so the first thing I did when they asked me to work on this project was to call every single person on that list and ask them for their view of school violence. And that really helped to kind of give us a base um, to start to figure out what was being said out there, what was happening. We found out a number of our incidents through some of that, too. So that helped out. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Yes. Yes, please. Um, one of the stories in Sarah, your... Sarah, you have to say who I'm you sorry. are. I'm sorry. Sarah White's Kodacek um, in the Stabile program here at Columbia. Um, one of the stories in your series uh, profiled um, a Houston school district that employed uh, like 400 police officers as a model of, you know, a more effective way of, of dealing with school violence. And um, I'm wondering if you did that in any way to suggest a possible way of reforming the school system. I know that's sort of a, um, a difficult line that journalists aren't necessarily supposed to be abdicating any particular solutions. Um, do you see that as what, what was your thinking in including that example where you kind of went out of your way to find this model? And then also your choice to end the series with um, South Philadelphia High School, the new principal who was sort of pioneering a better future. Well, uh, I guess there are a couple of answers to that. One is, you know, a lot of journalists just think they ought to be like Werner von Braun and shoot off a rocket and, and they shouldn't care where it lands. And, um, we really did pay attention to best case solutions. And it isn't necessarily, uh, you know, having more police in the schools. In fact, that was a follow-up story, and I'll explain that in a second. It, in the series, what we did is we found, really, you have to alter the climate in the schools. And that's very important. Um, and there are strategies to do that, really starting with, with young children and building up through high school, peer me uh, mediation and, and so on. Uh, and we found, actually, we went to, um, where was it, Palm Beach, right, uh, in Florida, w which has a very effective uh, in-school um, way of dealing with, with incidents of violence and a much more sure method of, of dealing with it. One of the problems in Philadelphia is you, you constantly had different um, uh, principles applying different uh, uh, <clears throat> remedial measures, and they, there was no consistency. The reason we went to Houston is is that the uh, 
uh, mayor and the uh, chief of police um, said, well, maybe we should put armed cops in the schools. So we actually looked uh, for a district that was comparable in size where they had armed cops in the schools. And Houston was the district that matched up Philadelphia in terms of not just size, but the makeup of the student body. And actually, you know, when we looked at it, they did a much better job than Philly. Um, you know, the, one of the key aspects was they actually screened their officers and they were professional. I mean, we did a story, that a, a, a follow-up, where we were, you know, you heard about the no standards for hiring school cops. The lead-off was a cop who was an admitted uh, crack addict, uh, had been in a crack rehab program, was still a school cop, was a two-time loser getting arraigned in her school uniform on the opening day of school. Uh, so. Yeah. Can, can we ask both of you to answer, um, to ask questions quickly? Are you both? And then we'll have them give a quick answer because we have to move on. I was just wondering, what advice or tips do you have for um, maybe a much smaller news organization, a small daily paper that wants to tackle the same kind of investigation on much leaner resources that maybe doesn't have the, and as much people to pour through um, all the data coming in? Are there any tips you have that, you know, can this still be done, this level of investigation, do you think, on a, s a small staff? And, and, my, and, and my question would just ask both of you to ask the questions and then we'll get quick answers. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, I'm, I'm curious, you talked about the uh, the people that were involved in the schools themselves, but you also talked about a, a really successful superintendent that you ended up getting fired, and I'm really curious to hear about the interaction you had with her uh, from the beginning and how that evolved toward uh, the later stages of the reporting when it was clear that there was going to be uh, this level of wrongdoing showed in your reports. I'll take, take this one over here, and you want to take that one? Yeah. So? Um, yeah. Okay. Why don't we take the other question at the end of the panel, because we can then ask all the panelists about, you know, what tips would you have for for news organizations which do not have the resources to do these kinds of investigative reporting. And then you take the last question. Okay, sure. Yeah, I think, I mean, the superintendent, Arlene Ackerman at the time, um, I mean, one of the reasons we started looking into this was because of her response to the um, incident at South Philadelphia High School. She, was very, she didn't go to the school for a number of days after the, that incident, and that really, so, so that made us say, okay, wait a second, we know violence has been a problem for a very long time, but um, looking at this response, uh, we really feel like we need to, um, you know, take a closer look. And I think, you know, she pretty much, you know, resisted um, the work we were doing at times, you know, didn't, didn't really want to spend a lot of time, you know, talking to us about it. But um, in the end, she had a lot of other issues that were causing her problems, um, you know, from management to finances. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't to, just the school answers. cheating. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Philadelphia is, had, they've discovered, and we, we were the first to document systematic cheating on their achievement tests over a long period of time. So her whole claim that the schools were getting better every year and year was, was spurious. Right. Thank you.